Hi, this is Greg Weissman, the voice of Lucas Carr, and you're listening to Whelm, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Greg Wiseman, 0, 0, 1. Recognized, Brandon Vietti, 0, 0, 2. Initiate part 1. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we welcome two very special guests, Greg Wiseman and Brandon Vietti. While these two people probably need no introduction for our listeners, I'm going to do one anyway. Uh, Brandon Vietti is the director of several DC animated projects, including Batman the Brave and the Bold, Batman Under the Red Hood, The Legion of Superheroes, and most recently, the interactive film experience Batman Death in the Family. Greg Weissman has written for at least a dozen of your favorite animated series, as well as being the co-creator of Spectacular Spider-Man and Gargoyles. But here on Whelmed, they're both probably best known for being the producers and co-creators of Young Justice. Greg, Brandon, I am so excited to welcome you back to Wilmed. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including all three seasons so far, the comics, the video game, and perhaps even the DC fandom audio play, if we get to that. If you have not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, consider this your warning. And as an additional note, uh, we will not be talking about season four beyond what's already been announced, since that is still very much under wraps, and I don't want to get anybody's hopes up. (laughs) Now, with all of that out of the way, let's dive in. So generally, we start by asking our guests who they are and what they do and when they first saw Young Justice. But last time we had you on, uh, Rich did an awesome deep dive into both of your respective histories. with comics and animation and Young Justice. But since we've only got a limited time today, uh, instead of retelling an entire superhero origin story, I'm just going to recommend people check out that episode so we can jump straight into some questions. If that's all right with everybody here. Sounds good. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I don't want to rob you the moment of getting to tell your origin story, but also... (laughs) (laughs) So... I feel uh, we covered that, I guess. Yeah, I think... Maybe, maybe a little. (laughs) So I have to ask, since we are recording this in the middle of a pandemic, how has the current state of the world uh, affected the Young Justice production process? The YJ creation process has always seemed really collaborative from everyone we've talked to involved with the show, uh, from making giant flashcard boards to having as many actors as possible in recordings for each episode. So how have you all adjusted to working from home? We've been adjusting. I mean, like everybody else, we've been incredibly, incredibly lucky to be able to kind of pick up our work and take it home with us. So our entire crew has been working at home. We didn't actually miss a beat in production. I think we probably had to slow down a little bit for technology. I mean, a lot of us had to maybe bring some technology home from work with us and work with IT to get everything up and running and you know, there's just sort of, uh, you know, technological adjustments, uh, setting up your home space to work, working with family around, you know, those kinds of things for our artists. And, you know, everybody was able to set up and, and we've been moving along, still adjusting, you know, there's still little things. I think it, it's almost like a life reset, this whole pandemic and this whole working from home thing. Yeah. I think everybody's, you know, mostly found their sea legs, but I think still fine tuning how to do this. There have been some processes that I think are more challenging. Creating the art was probably the easier adjustment, but I think, you know, Greg can jump in on this too, but I mean, voice records have been very challenging. That slowed to a stop for a while, but picked up again as we've found ways to do that safely for everybody. You know, there's still some some actors that record from home with their home setups. Some can come to a studio, but it's in a much more limited capacity for safety reasons yeah we've we've Um, gone from doing group records which was our norm 
and then you know the occasional person who couldn't make the group record would record separately so now we're doing one actor at a time period yeah. um, whether they're recording from their home or studio we're still doing one actor at a time and as you can imagine that slows the process yeah way <laughs> down so by now normally we'd have recorded we'd be done with 24 out of 26 episodes from a recording standpoint. And instead we're not that far behind. We're, we finished episode 22 yesterday, but we've got only pieces of 23 and 24. And um, there, we've got a long way to go before we even get to 25, let alone 26. There's another problem with 26. I haven't actually written it yet, but, um, but I'm working on that. Yeah, we know the story. Yes. We finished yeah. the story, but now there's the, the fine matter of the script. <laughs> so has the writing process changed at all? Like, I assume most of it is just one person going off and writing a script and bringing it back. But like, have you had to change any of the other ways that you do that for kind of like brainstorming stories together as a group? Yeah, we... You know, the way we used to work is uh, Brandon and I would write the stories together in my office with the big bulletin board uh, covered with index cards. And strangely, my wife didn't want to um, wallpaper our house with cork board. <laughs> so we have no giant bulletin board here at uh, Casa Weissman. But um, so I just sort of took a table and spread out some cards, but it, it doesn't work the same way at all and you can't really see it and, um, so it, it's been a, and other work and everything like that it, it, it became a much slower process getting the last what did you say about half dozen episodes broken give or take yeah and uh with the gaps between our our story sessions so we'd like forget where we left off and right you know without the, like the wall is so helpful because it's just, it's all there. You can, you know, walk in, I can walk in, just quickly scan the wall and remember where we left off. Greg, same thing. But without that, you know, then it's like, he's literally reading the cards over, over FaceTime or something to me. And like, we're trying to keep it all in my head. And it's definitely just, it's not as easy. Yeah. And then, you know, we had writers meetings where everyone get together and, We'd have lunch and we'd talk with the directors and we still did that over zoom it's not quite as much fun but it gets the job done but we also just um not hugely again not hugely behind but we because of all the things i'm talking about we fell a bit behind on the writing so the lat you know uh, i was always planning to write the last script but uh i had to write 25 as well because we just were out of time and it, it's just faster for me to do it um, yeah. than sending it out to a writer, waiting for that writer to get done. Then it comes back to me. I edit it. It's just, if I write it in the first place, it just gets everything. It helps us catch up. Yeah. Cause we're, like I said, not way behind, but a tiny bit behind it. And, and you know, there are artists and all sorts of people waiting for that pipeline to get filled. Yeah. So um, we had to sort of speed it up a little bit at some point, but, but in general, that's been okay. Uh, post is something of a challenge post-production because internet is somewhat unreliable. And like, for example, my screen isn't color corrected. You know, it's not, uh, is that even the right term? I can't remember. You know, when we're looking at color in particular, you're, you're not a hundred percent sure of what, I'm seeing is the same as what Brandon's seeing is the yeah. same what our editor's seeing or our Quantel uh, editor's seeing or our effects editor's seeing. And, and so that's become a challenge and sound is also an issue. So we've got plans for how to do mixes and, and onlines and reviews and, um, and do them safely pandemic wise, something that a year ago I, you know, would not have given <laughs> any thought to obviously. Um, but, I never thought of a sound mix as being unsafe, you know, yeah. <laughs> or as potentially being unsafe. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like, you know, that they're just fun. No, now they're, they're potentially unsafe. So we have to, um, you know, find a safe way to do it. And 
So it's all a learning process, but we figured it out, or at least we're figuring yeah. it out, you know, as we go um, step by step. But uh, so I, you know, I definitely feel like we're among the fortunate when it comes, you know, we're still employed, we're uh, the crew's healthy, everyone's good. It's not our ideal way of working, <laughs> but it's not, it hasn't been a problem either. So, you know, it, it just becomes uh, the new now and how we deal. Yeah. So taking this back to a, to a different time, now that we've covered the now, uh, so prep for recording this discussion, I went back and I re-listened to the last time we had you guys on our show, talking to Rich along with Phil Barasa. Uh, and near the very end of that episode, a topic came up that literally everyone in the room was like, oh, I wish we had time to talk about that. And then you guys had to wrap it up. And I was like, well, I know what I have to include in this. So the question came up of how did you decide on who the lead characters were for season one? And how did you build that team and make those decisions? There was a combination of factors we were looking for. I mean, we started with a list of something like, and I could look it up, I guess, but something like 50 <laughs> or so teen heroes from DC. And, you know, you go through and DC has a lot. I mean, you know, there's, Nearly, I mean, 80 years of continuity, lots of heroes over time. Some of them are not teens anymore, but started as teens. And if they were ever teen heroes, we put them on the list. DC had four blonde female archers, because obviously three blonde female archers wasn't enough. Um, and so we compiled this list and we were looking for a combination of qualities. We wanted characters with superpowers. We wanted characters with just mad skills. We wanted characters, you know, we wanted a diverse group. Since Secrets and Lies was such a big theme for our show, we wanted to have some characters that were keeping secrets or telling lies about who they were or, or what was going on with them. And um, that was important. At the time, there were a couple teenage characters who were off limits, the two Wonder Girls. I have no idea why, but they were. <laughs> and then partway through season one, we were told, oh, now you can use them, but it was too late for season one. Yeah. But that being told that the two Wonder Girls were off limits, Donna and Cassie, came so early in the process that it's not like, oh no, we've got to yank them out. It was, you know, it was so early that we were told we couldn't use them that they never really were considered. They were on that list. That's the most I can say, but they weren't ever really considered. And, and we just started narrowing things down. There was a sense of- I think we also, yeah, the history. I think, you know, we were, we were very much conscious of the fact that we were sort of beginning a specific age in, in our- Earth-16 universe, it was still early days of the Justice League. And we knew as we grew the show, we were going to be sort of growing the all the heroes and villains in the DC universe as well, having some characters pop up for the first time, publicly anyway, at least within our, our continuity. So that helped narrow things down too, knowing that, okay, well, the, the roster of the Justice League isn't very big anyway of that roster, you know, who would have sidekicks that we could work with and start telling stories about as well. So that was, I think, also part of the, the factor in narrowing things down and then figuring out where we could grow and bring in other characters as we grew the universe around our, our core team. Very interesting, because I think people have always kind of wondered, because it's like, you can't separate that initial team like from the show like i can't imagine anyone else there but looking back and you're like how did we get here uh, <laughs> especially yeah, like i mean there was a, a definite desire i think at least on my part probably brandon's too to, <laughs> to sort of you know the original teen hero book was brave and the bold putting together aqualad kid flash and robin and there was a a desire on my part to sort of do our version of that. Obviously we were creating a brand new Aqualad 
but we wanted to use the Wally West Kid Flash. We wanted to use the Dick Grayson Robin. We wanted it to be those early days and this sense of these heroes coming together for the first time that they knew each other, but this was their first sort of adventure together. So despite the title, we weren't specifically adapting the Young Justice comic from the 90s. We weren't adapting specifically 80s Teen Titans. We weren't adapting specifically 60s and 70s Teen Titans either. You know, we just doing the DC universe, but we wanted that sense of history in there. We knew that we were going to do time skips and in success. I mean, you know, if we didn't get a second season, there wasn't going to be a time (laughs) skip, but um, fortunately we did. So we knew we were going to do that. So the idea of course was to have the Dick Grayson Robin knowing that as time passed, he would become Nightwing and we'd introduce, you know, Tim Drake and, uh, knowing that we'd introduce Impulse and Bart Allen and growing the show because we were adapting from scratch, it allowed us to take a character like Miss Martian from another era and bring her into that earlier era without messing up the continuity much. And we really found the idea of Artemis with her villainous parents really appealing. And that was something she could keep a secret. Miss Martian's being, you know, not really looking the way she looked was a big secret for her to keep and and the idea of the clone superboy was a sort of fascinating to us you know what happens if you're born at age 16 you know what does that mean to you how much of your mind is your own you know all those issues that we explored during season one continue to explore frankly all the way into season four not a spoiler but you can put money on that is uh something that fascinated us from the beginning and again helped us build the show out of those six and we also knew that as the season progressed we wanted to add Zatanna and Rocket to the show so that bring it again but we really were intent on expanding the team gradually so that you open with three heroes add a fourth then add a fifth then a sixth then a seventh than an eighth um, to allow us to really get to know these characters as you met them, as opposed to, Hey, we're going to start with eight. Boom. You're eight you characters. All of them. Immediately love them all. You know, it, it, we, we really gradually tried to bring them in step by step so that, you know, episode one really focuses on three. Then we add Superboy at the very end, but we don't really get to know him until episode two. We introduce Miss Martian in episode two, but we don't get to know her till three. And we don't introduce Artemis until six and Zatanna and Rocket even later. So it it just became, uh, you know, not to sort of hit the, as big as our cast was and is, and now it's of course ridiculous, but um, we just wanted to grow it all gradually and really give the audience time to fall in love with each of the leads. Yeah. Related to that. I remember we've, me and Rich have talked about this a couple of times, the way that you, as a writing team, you have created this world that draws on so much of the DC history while also weaving in entirely new stories and entirely new relationships and dynamics between characters. Was that something that you always intended to do or did you kind of start off and then as you introduced those characters gradually realize like, oh, this is how these characters would interact? Yeah, I mean, I think there was an evolution there. I mean, we were always looking at the source material for influence, but, you know, I think we had a lot of freedom from from DC. We had a lot of discussions with DC, but a lot of freedom from, from DC in terms of growing things our way you know and some of that came out of I mean it comes from a variety of places I think there's just stuff that Greg wants to do there's stuff that I want to do there's stuff that probably occurs organically as we start to progress the story and the characters evolutions that occur that we we don't even expect from day one ourselves but the story kind of takes the characters that way and I think also just you know once our our voice actors become involved we learn more about the characters through our voice actors that help define the characters. And that is also informative as well. So I, 
it, it's, you know, it's hard to kind of pin it down to one particular answer because I feel like it's very organic and it's, it's evolving. I mean, a good example of that is in season three with Beast Boy. You know, we knew in season three that we had this huge cast and that we wanted to focus down on a, a smaller group. Not that we wouldn't see other characters, but that we wanted to focus down on a smaller group that included Superboy and Nightwing and Tigress, but also uh, Geoforce and Halo and Forager. And then a little later, again, gradually adding in uh, Cyborg and Terra. So we had to sort of find reasons why certain characters weren't playing in the forefront anymore. And so one of the a good example of that was, all right, well, Beast Boy, he's basically left the game and he's off being a TV star. And that was our plan for Beast Boy for the season, honestly. And then as we're writing the thing, Beast Boy's like standing up going, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not done. I'm not done. I have stuff I need to do this season. And honestly, that was a prime example of the character telling us what uh, he, she, or they wanted, needed to be doing. And we try and listen to that, you know. Yeah. It sounds, um, I don't know, goofy, I guess. But the fact is, is that, you know, you, you put a character on a path and you start telling that character's story. And at some point, the character begins to tell you what the next step in, in that path is. And for Beast Boy, it became about forming this, you know, new team that, was young heroes but wasn't in the shadows it's yeah. in some ways you know just the antithesis of what we did in season one season one was all about a teenage team operating covertly and his whole thing was like the covert is the problem and then you know at the end you sort of come to the conclusion you know we need both they're not mutually exclusive we need them both but that idea of coming up with a out there teenage team really generated out of Garfield's personality, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah. And where we took him as a character, I mean, as he, as he became an actor, still an activist, a, too. An activist and, and a, a voice for his generation, you know, it, it was, uh, too close to what we wanted to do with the story. I mean, you know, weaving social media into the story in, in such an important way, uh, having, you know, one character come forward who would be, who would, it would make sense to have them really tied to that, really focused on that, very savvy about how social media works, how media works, um, its effect on people and society and culture. Beast Boy was the guy that made sense to kind of spearhead the story that we wanted to tell there and then figure out, you know, what is he going to do? What are his next steps going to be uh, as a hero, as an activist, as a person? So that really helped bring him back in. And it just, it, it just made sense for everything that we had written and known about the character before, you know, and kind of knowing where we wanted to go with the story. He was the one that kept coming forward <laughs> and literally telling us like, I, I'm the one that, that leads this story. <laughs> I'm in this story. <laughs> Actually, diving in, I'm skipping around a bit in my outline now because speaking of Beast Boy, I have a question straight from the mind of Rich Howard. I wanted to make sure this was asked about the episode Nightmare Monkeys, which Rich has talked a lot about because Rich really loved Nightmare Monkeys. And he start, his, his question that he sent to me to ask was that it was such a deeply spiritual journey for Garfield in that episode with the ongoing fever dreams and everything related to his past and his future. So, which is apparently, according to Rich, who knows about these things, sometimes referred to as an ego shattering is what that kind of journey is known as. So he was wondering what was the inspiration for that episode specifically and what in Garfield's comic history made you feel like that was kind of the best take for his arc for that episode and the whole season. Do you remember? <laughs> I know it's been a while. It's probably been a very long time. I mean, I, I knew one of the things that I, one of the things I knew I wanted to do was introduce the idea of the monkey guy. I knew I wanted to do that. I wanted to get 
we didn't term it this in the show, and I'm not sure if we're gonna, but that concept of the red, you know, that yeah. Swamp Thing is the green and guys like Animal Man and Beast Boy are the, and Vixen are the red, that they get their powers from this sort of, you know, animal-based life. I mean, we loved our Miss Martian blood transfusion origin for Beast Boy, but it didn't seem complete. Yeah. We never thought of it as complete. And so we showed the monkey biting him, even as it seemed like just a little Easter egg. Oh, the monkey's biting him like in the comics, but he's just chewing on him, you know, kind of thing. But, you know, when you see in a show like ours, where we try to ground even the fantasy and science fiction in as much reality as we can, the idea that he can transform from a whale to a chipmunk with, you know, no conservation of mass whatsoever was problematic for us to think of as only being a science fiction origin alone. And so the idea of the monkey God was something I knew I wanted to get in there. Um, We knew we wanted to explore his relationship with Perdita. We knew we had the good goggles that we needed to sort of out as a tool of the bad guys. Uh, And then he had so much history Um, The Doom Patrol, we knew, you know, it was interesting that people took for granted that when between season one and two, which was a five year gap that immediately after mom died, he went to live with McGann. And I get why they took that for granted, but that was never our intent. The idea was that, no, he went from his mom to um, Rita but Rita was part of the Doom Patrol and the Doom Patrol died. And then he went to McGann. And uh, then from McGann, he went to his sort of pseudo foster stepfather. And then he, you know, became a emancipated minor. And so we had all these sort of notions of his history that we had sort of skipped over. And I had sort of thought people would guess what would happen in the middle. And they really didn't. And so it's like, well, we've got blanks to fill in here. And what's a fun way for us to do that? We also feel like we've set this precedent of having at least one song per season. So we need, we we just came up with the notion. We didn't instantaneously write Doom Patrol Go, but we came up, Brandon and I came up with the idea of that. And there was also that in the middle of our long, hiatus or five-year hiatus or whatever you know teen titans go had really helped carry the flame for the show and had done the you know let's get serious episode with calder yeah. and superboy yep. and martian and we were like okay well they sort of tributed us we should tribute them a little and so all these things sort of came together and i'm saying all this like it was a big cohesive plan but really, I don't know that it was. I think it was just everything sort of came together. Either that or I just don't remember. No, it, it, I mean, that's the organic process, though, is we, we kind of, we do come in with these lists together of things that we want to do, and they end up on cards on a wall, and it's this, you know, vast spider web of interconnected, well, actually not connected ideas that we then figure out a way to connect in a way that creates a meaningful story for the characters. So... So yeah, I mean, the, the Teen Titans Go tribute thing was like kind of high on my list for things to do. I had no idea how we were going to arrive at it. And I think, I, I think we were discussing fever dreams. Like I'd always wanted to do, I like things that are stories that are very psychological and trying to get in a, into a fever dream to present, you know, that sort of a cartoony style in our show was like kind of the only thing that made sense to me to present a, a proper tribute. And then, you know, I think, you know, again, like Greg said, we were just kind of talking through Garfield's story and the things that were left out. But we also knew we were we were presenting him, representing him this season as in third season as, uh, you know, he'd been an actor for a while. He'd done that thing. He'd become successful. He was so, sort of it felt to us, I think, like he was a little bit of a crossroads or he could be at a crossroads. Yeah. And then with all of the other things that are going on in the world around him, what's going to happen to him to kind of move him past the crossroads and onto the next leg of his journey. And I think that's where, you know, we started to, well, it's okay. Let's take 
that history and the fever dream and, you know, Teen Titans Go and like make it into Doom Patrol Go to tell part of that story. And it's all fun, but it was all grounded to try to get him emotionally past this certain place in his life through that crossroads that he was at and onto the next leg of his journey. One other thing that came into play is that, you know, we had every intention of bringing back uh, Logan Grove and Ariel Winter as Garfield and Perdita, but um, neither of them were available for a third season. And so in discussion with Jamie Thomason, our voice director and casting director, we came up with the idea of casting Greg Sipes, who plays Beast Boy in Teen Titans Go and Teen Titans, to play Beast Boy as a, you know, an older teen. And suddenly we had the Beast Boy from Teen Titans Go in our show. We also had, you know, the guy who plays Cyborg in our show, because that's Kari Payton. And we had to recast Perdita. And we actually held auditions for Perdita because, you know, you had to match that accent. And, and Hinden, you know, just was fantastic as Perdita. And so suddenly we had three out of the four in there. And then uh, Tara Strong was also our Tara Markov. So then we had four out of the five in the show. And suddenly it was like, well, we bring in Scott Menville and we've got the cast of Teen Titans Go to play the Doom Patrol Go characters. And, and we sort of were able to sort of relate each one by switching from negative man to negative woman. Suddenly we had our Raven. We had, you know, Elastic Girls personality wise seemed to fit Starfire and Robot Man could be Cyborg and, and Chief could be, who's the leader, could be Robin. And suddenly it was like, this is almost too perfect. We kind of, now we have to do it. We have no choice. It's yeah. not up to us. And that, that was, you know, sometimes it just, I don't know, it's like kismet or something, you know, it just seems to work out. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, we just had a blast and Dynamic Music Partners did such a great job with the song and, and it's catchy. It's, you know? it's very catchy in the weirdest way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I distinctly remember that episode coming out and me watching it the morning it premiered uh, and just kind of like cry laughing through that sequence. I was like, I don't know how to feel. My roommate literally at the time was like, are you okay? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, this is hilarious and catchy, and everything they're saying is so horrible and dark. That was the idea. Yeah, no, oh. it worked. You hit every note you were trying to. <laughs> it worked perfectly. So moving on from all of that, too, I want to throw in some of our wonderful questions from our wonderful Patreon supporters very quick in the middle here. From one of our patrons, Thomas Groves, asked... What is it like to create such a massive and interconnected world? And how did you end up choosing Earth-16 as the designation for that world? It's very hard making an <laughs> interconnected world that I would assume. Big. Yeah. We keep track of. That's the hard part. It's, it's not so hard to create it. It's hard to keep track of it and keep it straight. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. So we, it's good that we write things down because <laughs> our brains can't keep it all in there. But yeah, sorry, what was the second part of the question? I, I got so lost. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, That's it's fine. really hard making the show this big. Understandable, but, I would assume. Uh, it's a lot of characters to keep track of. Considering you started with just the teen heroes having a list of 50 to choose from, I assume dealing with the entire DC universe is even more overwhelming. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and we're trying to keep track of passage of time and, <laughs> and time zones and all sorts of stuff that just, uh, it's a nightmare. <laughs> you mean having time <laughs> stamps on every enjoy. scene Don't is difficult? <laughs> but it is, it's a nightmare. <laughs> and I have also forgotten the second part of the question. <laughs> Fair enough. The, uh, the second part of Tom's question <laughs> was, how did you end up choosing Earth-16 as the designation for the Young Justice uh, world? Uh, so we uh, asked DC at the time, and I'm not sure if this is still true, <laughs> <laughs> at the time, DC had decided that instead of having infinite Earths, they had 52 Earths, specifically. And some of them they had explored, 
and some of them they had. So we went to them and said, hey, can we have an earth that's ours that is unexplored? And I did say, you know, because we're a show about teenagers, it would be great if it was like, you know, 15, 16, 17, somewhere in there. Yeah. And they gave us Earth 16, and we were under the assumption that they'd never done anything with Earth 16. I mean, we knew that there were some Earths they had explored and some that they hadn't out of 52. And so we thought nothing had ever been done with Earth 16. And then after it was way too late to change course, animation, you know, isn't a rapid fire kind of media, you know, medium. You know, it's a, it's a very big ship and turning it takes time and there are points of no return on certain things. And um, long after it was too late to change, we were informed that, oh yeah, a, a little bit had been done with her 16. <sighs> and so we were really left with no choice but to ignore what little they had done with her 16. And my understanding is is that um, Grant Morrison, who had done stuff with her 16, felt the same way towards us. So in the comics, I guess, the Earth 16 in the comics, I think he established that Young Justice is a TV show you can watch on that Earth 16. There's Earth and 16 A and Earth 16 B. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I mean, you know, we asked for a world that was in essence, we asked for a universe that was pristine. Uh, and we thought that's what they gave us. And then after the fact, we found out it wasn't quite, but, uh, you know, we've made it ours. It's Earth 16 and uh, there's no turning back. <laughs> no, all of those 10 million 16s throughout three seasons. I know. I think, I think that kind of claims it. <laughs> so we also have from another one of our patrons, Ben Schwartz uh, had a couple of questions. So the first one was, how does the medium of animation define your considerations when writing or directing an animated show or film? I'm assuming like in comparison to if you were working in live action and had the limitations of live action, how does animation kind of change that for you as directors and writers? Uh, it, it's a great question because um, animation is uh, and what it, what it takes to animate the stories that we tell is always on our mind when we're breaking stories. Um, we have an enormous cast, as everybody knows, an enormous list of characters, but we cannot put all those characters on screen at the same time, or we would really hurt all artists involved in having to draw all of that. And it's a, a budget consideration, too, in terms of how many new characters we can put on screen versus you know, reused characters that we've already designed. So as we, as we break every story, we're double-checking ourselves for character count, for location count to make sure that we're not asking for more than our team can supply. And that, I mean, that even includes like lighting situations. You know, we have to keep track of time of day or different location lighting situations because every new lighting situation, of course, is a, a whole new round of ink and paint and background paint and all of that. So that's considered. Um, we're also taking into account our storyboard deadlines and our animation team overseas. Uh, because we, we don't want to write a story that's wall-to-wall -wall fighting or something. It's ridiculously difficult to pull off an, you know, an awesome action scene. And with characters moving around that much, that's that much more to draw. And so we have to, again, you know, write to our, write to our, our reducible, that is doable, at a, at a, in a way that allows them to keep the quality level up. Um, I think, you know, fortunately, you know, our, our show kind of leans into drama. Um, Greg and I love to write toward drama. So yeah. that means a, a lot of people talking, you know, dialogue scenes are so important to us for, for character development. And so we do lean into that in the show sometimes. And just like you see in this, and this happens in a lot of anime, it's sort of a, a regular practice of a lot of anime to have episodes that lean into drama so that you can kind of energies for that big all-out action episode that comes you know two episodes later yeah. so those are the kinds of things that we are trying to take into account um, as we're writing it all starts with the script and so we have to be very conscious of that nice conclude part one 
You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.